So you started actually by making passive speakers when you made Vanderstein many years ago. And maybe 20 years ago, you started making active speakers. And I'd like to know what made the change or why you decided to do that. Uh, good question, Brad. We, at the time, um, two things happened. 35 years ago, we were working on subwoofers. Subwoofers had a bad reputation. Uh, they were difficult, if not impossible, to blend with a good system. So there was a lot of negativity. So a lot of it was the woofer design, the driver design, the cabinet wasn't uh, silent enough. Even after solving all of those problems, though, we had a problem with it just didn't want to blend as if it were seamless. You don't really want to hear the subwoofer. You just want the main speakers to get bigger. And that didn't really happen until... Um, you know, you're, you're using an amplifier to drive the subwoofer and the customer might be using a tube amp to drive his main speakers. And the discrepancy in the amplifiers is part of what was causing this difficulty in the blend. So every amplifier has a current stage where it multiplies the current and it has a voltage gain stage where the gain is. So we designed the amplifier where the voltage gain was or is the customer's amplifier by driving it off of the output terminals of the main amplifier, just like the speaker, and, uh, and also the speaker. And this carried that character on down into the low frequency and allowed a seamless blend. Then fast forward 10 more years, it was time to make a flagship speaker, which was the Model 5. And there were a couple of things at the time. People like speakers that are not that large, but sound big, that have really good deep bass. I believe the foundation of music is bass. Without bass, we don't have music. So I wanted the speakers to get down to 20 hertz. And large cabinets that would be required to get that low um, are um, you know, not good for sound. Um, difficult to make a speaker image well that has large can, large flat surfaces, hard to control the panel resonances, and just very difficult. So going with the same principles that we used in the subwoofer uh, 10 years before and applying that to a full range loudspeaker with the powered subwoofer built in allowed us to make the cabinet much smaller, allowed us to um, get down to the 20 hertz, the target that I was looking for. and. Uh, if I had my rathers and could afford uh, to do so, every speaker we would make would have a powered woofer because it's all plus, no minus. Okay, so just to be clear, uh, you're building essentially a subwoofer section in. It's not fully amplified top to bottom. No, it's just the internally. No, it's just the subwoofer. Yeah, just the subwoofer, and that was to get this blend, which will. Uh, talk about a little bit more. Um, I think that's a, a key point. Um, it was it seemed like an aha moment to you when you were able to blend the characteristic of the amplifier into the speaker. Yeah, and exactly. So, how does that happen? Well, the other difficult thing that you have in a loudspeaker is crossing over into a subwoofer. A good frequency to do that is 80 or 100 hertz. The problem is you then need a mid-bass driver above that, and it's very difficult passively to cross over a driver in an enclosure because your impedances are all over the place, requires large uh, inductors, would have to be iron core, which are not the best sounding, and the, the capacitor values would be huge, which would involve electrolytics. All of this is not conducive to good sound. So along with the subwoofer, we also divide, devise this principle of using a high pass, whereby using a very, very high quality battery bias capacitor acting on the input resistance of the customer's amplifier, it forms an absolutely pure 6 dB per octave crossover high pass at, in this case, 100 hertz. The uh, signal, it also then gives us the crossover that we need it for the mid-bass driver without any components with the amplifier dampening uh, co factor connected directly to the driver. The subwoofer amplifier knows this is going on and builds this falling signal back up, very similar to how we deal with 
phono cartridges in uh, LP playback. So uh, if I'm summarizing this correctly for, uh, for my thought process, you are able to actually take 100 hertz and below and turn it down and then send it to a specialized amplifier internally that then t turns it back up to the normal levels. That's correct. That's exact, it's exactly how it works. And we have a small compact enclosure. The other advantage we have is that this amplifier, the driver that's in the subwoofer, and the cabinet that's in the subwoofer can all be designed to be exactly by using feed forward. In other words, you know what the issues are, you can correct for them in advance and, uh, and get uh, better performance than you'd have using anybody's really, really high quality amplifier trying to drive a woofer in a component. You have interconnecting wires, just so many variables that being able to, in, 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 to design it as one complete functioning unit doing exactly what we want it to do is also a tremendous value. Yeah. On a side note, one of the benefits Base to control woofers and everything requires a, 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 it's, it, it's good to use feedback. Feedback in an upper range speaker on a time and phase, phase correct speaker, feedback is a form of time distortion. So generally speaking, the best sounding amplifiers on a Vandersteen are usually those with low or very, very moderate use of feedback. Very interesting. So you, you have essentially two different requirements for the mids and highs and the low frequency, Ex the feedback. Exactly. Um, yeah. So would you say, I'm just going to pick some examples of a tube and a solid state, if you were to say use an air amplifier and then change to an audio research amplifier, the character of the bass would in fact change? Oh, absolutely. It will... Uh, uh, but that's a good question because tube amps are maybe, somebody says, well, do I really want my tube amp, what, do I really want that tube sound to go on into the bass? But the sample circuit is a couple of hundred K impedance. That waveform that's going to the bass coming off of that tube amp is nearly perfect. It's just its harmonic structure and everything is unique to that amplifier. But that amplifier, the main amplifier, in this case the audio research, does not have to control the woofer. That's being handled by the current multiplier, the amplifier that's built in. Same with an air. It would pass on its character, but the work of driving the woofer is, is relieved from that amplifier, which effectively doubles its power supply because all of the energy needed to drive the woofer has now been high passed. It's, not, it's only a sample that's taken. Right, so, so speaking of the high pass, you have a high pass box essentially that goes on the interconnect connecting to the amplifier. That makes people nervous. You know, audiophiles get very nervous when there's some sort of external box in the pathway. And uh, is that the best way to do it? Or can you explain why it's so necessary and, and what happens sonically when you put it in versus not having it in? Yeah, you've, you've, you know, the one thing is that uh, we putting more stuff in the signal path is something that all audiophiles are concerned with. Yeah. And it was an issue in the early days when we brought this out. And this is why it, um, it's passive and not active, because in an active crossover, you have tubes, solid state, you have power supplies, you have so many things that are involved in doing an electronic crossover. But beings that our, our system is designed for first order filters, which can be done with a very, very high quality Teflon cap, and the resistor that already exists in the customer's amplifier once that impedance is known. Um, by battery biasing those capacitors so that they are always fully formed, uh, they, that, that's more transparent than any electronic crossover or any filter could be done. And it's also more transparent than any passive filter because that would require electrolytics and that would require large iron core inductors to try to make that 100 hertz crossover. So the net gain, we know that we're taking a small step backwards, but to put the emphasis on that when it's made four steps forward would be a mistake in my opinion, and it's easy to prove.
Right, I think in any part of the system there are compromises to add benefit. Uh, exactly. Whether it be the loudspeaker or the cable or the turntable or whatever exactly. the system. Those are the decisions as an engineer you have to make. Right. Is that something that can be demonstrated? Yeah, in the early days when there was so much resistance, what we would do is select an amplifier, a dealer's favorite amplifier, that had a high input impedance, say 100K. And these high passes, both the M5 and the M7 high passes, are adjustable to all different impedance settings. Right. So we'd take the dealer's favorite full range speaker, whatever that was, didn't matter, and we would hook this up and then uh, listen to it on, a, on a, several pieces of music. And then I would misadjust the high pass. Uh, instead of putting it at 100 hertz, which would have for 100K, I would put it at a 20K impedance setting, which now moved the crossover down five octaves, down to about 20 hertz, for all intents and purposes, full range. Right. And we would then put that in the chain. And the surprise for the dealers were, why did it improve? Why does it sound better? It's more open, it's more transparent, the imaging is better. Well, part of the reason was we high pass the signal and it acts like a subsonic filter and removes some of the subsonics and the, and the drain that it puts on the power supply. So it actually improves the sound of the amplifier. Right. So here again, we proved, yes, obviously we went backwards a little bit because we have put more parts of the signal path but that the gain is an overall benefit. We've made three steps forward, which is a net gain of two. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> Linear thinking there. Yeah, very, very, very easy to prove and very yeah. necessary to do that in the early days because there was a lot of nervousness about that high pass. Maybe we'll start doing a few more of those, why not? Yeah. You know, let people hear that, definitely. So uh, you have some adjustability in your speakers to adjust to the position of the speaker in the room. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, we developed this flagship speaker, the Model 5, uh, uh, back in the day. It became obvious to me as a user, an, a fellow, you know, an audiophile, that finding the place in the room where the imaging and the um, speaker interfaced with the room best for imaging and uh, tonality and everything was not always, in fact, rarely was the same place where the bass was correct. So it became obvious to me that if you're going to make a full range speaker for any amount of money, there needed to be some way to adjust the bass to make it work where the speaker uh, had to be domestically or had to be sonically within any given space. It gives the dealer who installs a system uh, a lots of um, freedom. And the neat thing about that is that's done in the amplifier. It doesn't require a processor to, that processes the entire signal. The processing is done in the subwoofer amplifier. Most room correction systems require DSV and lots of very complex processing and it involves their mids and their highs. So talking about having an issue with a high pass in their audiophile pure system, imagine the negative reaction you're gonna to get to all that processing just to correct the bass. So we do it in the subwoofer amplifier where it does not affect the mids, highs, and, and, and the mid bass frequencies. Great, great, so if I'm understanding this correctly, you can position the speaker in a number of locations and still get great results. Absolutely, it gives, it gives you a lot more flexibility as to where the speakers will perform well in any given space. Right, yeah, because I'm used to setting up passive speakers and you can move them an eighth of an inch and everything changes. It makes, a it makes a difference, yes. Yeah. So that's, uh, that maybe explains why we hear many times at shows, oh, it's the Vandersteen room, of course it sounds good. Would you say that's the reason? <laughs> <laughs> it has a lot to do with it because you go to a show, you have a day to set up, you're in a strange room, it's a hotel room in most cases to boot. Yeah. It's not a very ideal situation. We have lots of tools available, but these same tools are very important in a person's home, in a, in a, in a sound room too. It just allows, that to, allows us to do it quicker. And um, 
yeah, it helps us do uh, make a nice presentation at the shows, and we usually do, and we usually get very favorable comments to that effect. Yeah, great. But it'll work in your home, too. Yeah, that's, a, that's more important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great, thank you. Yeah.